dive into a real political head scratcher. We're talking about a country where just poof, the top decision makers disappear. Vanished. Like, literally. Exactly. Eritrea's cabinet of ministers hasn't met in over half a decade, and we're going to try to figure out why. It's not like there was a revolution or anything, no big announcement. It's more like, how do I put this, a slow fade? Yeah. Like a slow fade out of the picture, Rip. nobody's saying why. And to unpack this mystery, we're turning to Martin Plott's article for the BBC, which features some pretty insightful commentary from political scientist Dr. Aidan Jabramskul and former Eritrean diplomat Ambassador Abdella Adam. Definitely some insider perspectives there. Okay, so Eritrea. They fought hard for their independence, finally got it in 1993. What did things look like back then, politically speaking, after all that? Well, the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, you know, the EPLF, they were the ones who led the fight. Naturally, they took the reins, formed what they called a provisional government. But even from the get-go, you could see the power was pretty centralized, mm -hmm. meaning it wasn't your typical democracy. Instead of uh, parliament or anything like that, they had a council. A council, huh? So not quite a cabinet yet at this point. Right. And who made up this council? Mostly military leaders with a few civilians thrown in. Already you get a sense of the military's influence. And what exactly was their role? Everything. Yeah. Literally everything. They made the laws set policies, mm. managed the country's resources, they held all the cards. So even in those early days, it wasn't exactly following the standard democratic playbook. Yeah. And this whole council setup, that was supposed to be temporary, right? Exactly. A transitional phase, four years max, while they wrote up a constitution and prepped for elections. Of course, we all know that's not how it played out. Mm. This transitional phase had a way of dragging on, didn't it? And there was also that shift in terminology from council to cabinet, just a cosmetic change or something more. It's interesting you caught that. Even in authoritarian regimes, words matter. Mm. That switch to cabinet might seem small, but it could have been deliberate, you know, trying to project an image of normalcy, a government that functions like others especially to the outside world. Trying to look the part, even if the reality was different. Precisely. But here's where things get even weirder. Because in 1997, Eritrea, they actually drafted a constitution. You mean that constitution, the one that's practically a myth now? All talk and no action. The very same. What's interesting about this document, which, let's be honest, nobody really paid attention to, is that it clearly lays out what the cabinet should be doing. Yeah. And it's a pretty idealistic view. They're supposed to be running the show, managing the budget, even drafting laws. Which is strange because if we're going by our sources, cabinet meetings were already happening less and less by then. They were practically writing a job description for a position they were already phasing out. That's a great way to put it. And after 2001, it gets even more obvious. Meetings were infrequent, totally dependent on whether the president felt like it. Sounds like President Isaiah Seforki was consolidating his power, even as they're writing a constitution that emphasizes a strong cabinet. It's a pattern. And sadly, not just in Eritrea, you see this in other authoritarian regimes, too, where formal governing structures kind of erode and power becomes more centralized, less transparent. Yeah, a classic case of action speaking louder than words, I guess. But back to Eritrea. If the cabinet was already being pushed aside, what was the final nail in the coffin, what made it actually disappear? Well, our sources point to one event in particular, the last known cabinet meeting back in 2018. Apparently it wasn't business as usual, kind of a tense atmosphere. Oh, what made it so different from the other meetings? President Efworki's son, Abraham, was there. Now that's interesting. His presence must raise some eyebrows. Was this Efworki grooming a successor, maybe giving his son a taste of how things work at the top? It's definitely a possibility, especially given that the cabinet basically went silent afterwards. Yeah. Could be a strategic move to keep the powers in the family, right? Or maybe it was more about sending a message, you know, asserting his authority. I see. So Abraham shows up, and it's like a not-so-subtle reminder of who's really in charge. Exactly. And this is where it gets tricky, because Eritrea is not exactly known for his transparency. We're left speculating, trying to read between the lines. But the bottom line is, those formal structures of government, the ones meant to keep things in check, they seem to have faded into the background. Leaving a system where power is even more centralized, decisions are made behind closed doors, and there's very little accountability. Which begs the question, how has this actually affected Eritrea? What's been the practical impact of not having a cabinet? Million dollar question, right? Eritrea is extremely tight-lipped, so getting a clear picture of the consequences is tough. Has it meant a total breakdown of governance, with things getting stuck, inefficient? 
Or, or has President Afriki just found other ways to get things done, sidestepping the cabinet altogether and concentrating power even more? Both are totally plausible, which is what makes this whole thing so fascinating mm -hmm. and a little unnerving, if you ask me. What? It makes you question what we think we know about how power works, mm -hmm. especially when you've got situations where those institutions on paper are weakened or worse, become irrelevant. It really highlights how fragile these institutions can be, even the ones that seem purely symbolic. What happens in Eritrea makes you wonder, could it happen elsewhere? That's the question, isn't it? It's a unique situation, sure, but it speaks to a much larger trend we're seeing around the world. Democratic backsliding, those institutional safeguards eroding. It's like we're missing a piece of the puzzle. You know, the cabinet's just gone and it leaves us with more questions than answers. So what does this all mean for Eritrea going forward? And what can we, you know, what can we learn from all of this? Well, I think it shows just how much power dynamics can shift without anyone really noticing. Mm -hmm. We tend to focus on the big stuff, the announcements, the laws. But sometimes it's the quiet changes, the ones happening in the background that have the biggest impact. It really makes you think twice about those checks and balances, those institutions that are supposed to keep things in line. If it can happen in Eritrea, could it happen anywhere? Is that what we're looking at here? That's the question, right? Eritrea is one case, but it reflects a pattern we're seeing globally. It's this slow erosion of democracy, this weakening of the safeguards that are supposed to protect it. It's a bit of a wake-up call, isn't it? Reminds us that we can't take democracy for granted. It takes work vigilance, holding on to those democratic principles and being wary of power that goes unchecked. Absolutely. So we've gone deep on Eritrea, this vanishing cabinet mystery. What are the big takeaways here? What should our listeners really keep in mind? I'd say, first and foremost, remember that leadership matters, but so do institutions. You need both to have a functioning democracy. And then transparency, accountability, those are crucial. When those things start to fade, it's a warning sign. And yeah. finally, we have to be aware that even small steps away from democracy can have huge consequences down the line. It's a reminder to pay attention, not just to what's happening in other countries, but to what's going on in our own backyards as well. We all have a role to play in protecting those democratic values. I'm well said. Well, that's about all the time we have for today's deep dive. Thanks to everyone for joining us as we delved into this political enigma. Hopefully we've given you some food for thought, maybe sparked your curiosity a bit. <music> Thank you.